Guest host and friend of the show, Julia Block, the esteemed editor. I've been trying to get her on the show for a while, and then we finally did to discuss this week's movie, which um, you know, normally, you, after the intro and like a good like five to ten minutes into the conversation, we we make this prolonged introduction to the topic of the show, which um, the movie, which typically, if you clicked on the show, you know what we're talking about. And this week, it's. Jonathan Demme's misbegotten 1983 film Swing Shift, which, as we'll go into later in this episode, got taken away from him, and a director's cut has been available for those who are a little mischievous and, and judicious in their searching on the internet to find it. Uh, someone did a VHS rip off of a work print of the director's cut years ago. And uh, a Sight and Sound article voted it one of the, or Sight and Sound article cited as one of the best movies of the 80s. And you'll have to listen to the episode to figure out if we agree with it. But spoiler alert, we do. Um, but first off, I was going to use Jonathan Demme as an excuse last week to just watch a ton of Jonathan Demme movies just because he's easily one of my favorite filmmakers and more his movies are so easily rewatched. And I end up only watching one, uh, Beloved, which, um, I mainly watched it just because I'd finally read uh, the book by Toni Morrison. And I was reading it because some a group of writers recently voted it one of the best, uh, three best books of the last 35 years. And I forget the third uh, book. I want to say it was something like Philip Ross' Sabbath Theater. But I remember one of the other books was Don DeLillo's Underworld, which is a favorite. So that little company, on top of there was this great descriptor where it talked about the um, attributes of all these other writers and they talked about paranoia and fear and like, you know, Delilo is really good at doing like ad copy for paranoia and things like that. And talked about Toni Morrison being um, the great authorial voice of love and something about that felt need for the time. So I read uh, Beloved for the first time, my first Toni Morrison book and it's a short book. It's not, it does, it barely touches 300 pages. And I remembered when I got around to watching the movie that it is a full three hour movie. And later in the conversation, me and Julia start talking about how and why the movie Swing Shift might have gotten taken away from Jonathan Demme and whether this likely was like the only the last time that had happened to him. And before this, I was thinking of Beloved where Beloved, I guess he had Final Cut on, but also it feels like it was taken away from him, but not really because it feels like it was um, voluntarily taken away from him. Because the thing is, I watched this movie a day after finishing the book and the book, as much as I loved it, there were giant chunks of its uh, poetic and eloquence that um, I just wasn't tracking what was happening plot wise, which, you know, you, we get this way in certain novels and when we read them and you read a book afterwards because it has this effect the adaptation something about it the filmmakers have to literalize what was very abstractly made into the language of the of the book and it's it's fascinating because there's so many books i remember reading seeing the movie like years later completely forgetting the plot of the books and then instantaneously seeing the movie remembering the plot and uh beloved the problem with odd thing about Beloved being this three hour movie to a very short book is that it very rigorously follows the structure of a novel, which even as a novel, the structure of it is makes some interesting choices to be quotation marks, interesting choices on how it reveals certain aspects of the plot. And I mean, this movie opens with a really bad or unfortunate uh, dog doll that has its eyeballs being popped out in the opening scene on a, on a plot line involving 
um, uh, the main character, Oprah Winfrey's character, Sethi's, uh, two sons, which if I were adapting this novel, those would be two th- w- to a movie. The sons would be two of the things I would cut out as an extraneous plot point. And it just, it goes, there's this quote by the uh, director or the author of Call Me By Your Name when he was visiting the set, uh, Andre Akiman, where um, he was trying to figure out exactly what was happening with the adaptation. And there's this quote I love about film adaptations from novel into film. His quote was, what I do is chisel a statue down to its finest, most elusive details. What a film director does is make the statue move. And the thing we've come to love about Jonathan Demme movies is how these movies always feel alive and breathe like normal human beings. And Beloved, unfortunately, feels like it's hindered structurally by a bunch of people who made it who are very beloved pun i don't know intended not intended you you guess very beloved of the novel and whether that is producer star oprah winfrey um everyone involved with the movie because they're making uh uh the only feature film to be adapted from nobel laureate or nobel prize winner tony morrison remains to be seen but um Anyway, as we move on into uh, Swing Shift, the adaptation game, the b- living, breathing film storytelling aspects of to, uh, go into it, um, it can become a much more complicated question. And I'm glad I had a great editor like Julia. One of the fun things about this was um, me and Julia, who um, are old friends and have worked together previously, um, this conversation just kind of comes off as two editors arguing over cuts on a film and that's kind of what an edit editing room is whereas it just ends up being preferences and who can make the best case so uh hope you enjoy this episode i've been thinking about this this week um uh this you, this is literally gonna be the second episode in a row with someone who has put me up while I stayed in New York. <laughs> oh, was it was it uh, with Henry last time? Yeah, Henry was last week, and like three people who put me up in New York have been guests on the show. Oh well, there's probably some strong correlation in that. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I, in that I sample to, pool. <laughs> that's a smart idea, putting two two together. Oh, but how many? My, uh... How many within that sample have also been a guest at your house in Austin? Because I have. Yeah, Henry hasn't. Uh, no one. Just you. Oh, boom! I'm already winning. <laughs> You're already, already winning. So, um, I guess. Um, well, first off, I was going to have you on. You already knew and guessed why, but you already poo-pooed that it was a good reason. Like the, <laughs> you had actually okay, you had actually worked with Jonathan Demi before, but you were an assistant editor, right? Work let, is definitely a stretch, but yes, I was I was working. Briefly. You weren't doing work, wasn't it? I was I was doing work on a Jonathan Demi film very briefly. Um, it was. I had to look it up actually because I couldn't remember when it was. It was 2012. Um, and the film was a master builder. It's um, the third of the trilogy with the uh, Wallace Shawn, is it? Or you know, I don't think it's part of any trilogy. But Wallace Shawn did write the screenplay based on the Ibsen play. Um, oh, I thought it was a there was a trilogy involved in my dinner with Andre or something. It's not ex- no, they're not. I mean, they. I mean, Wallace Shawn is the common denominator, but they're not related. Um, okay, so I'm wrong. Cool. And 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 Andre Gregory also is in the movie. Um, that, that's probably where I'm going from. With yeah, this. yeah. It was, it was very very cool. I mean, it was basically, um, I think Tim Squires was the editor, but there was for some reason there was like a month or a couple weeks where he wasn't going to be able to. He was finishing something else. There was some crossover, so Fonzie mm-hmm. was working on it with Jonathan just to get their. Def- Who was? Uh, Afonso Gonzalez. Afonso. Oh, okay. Oh, um, you got nicknames. <laughs> um, and 
so he asked me to come on as his AE. I mean, it was literally like four and a half weeks in September of 2012. But um, nevertheless, yeah, and it was, I mean, and it was basically... Did you have impressions of him? Of, of Jonathan Demi? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, because he, the first couple weeks, it was just Fonzie and me, you know, we were just working. We were in the same room, which was kind of fun. It felt very old school for an AE and the editor. It was a big room. But, um, but, uh, it, 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 okay. Like, I've yeah, had, I've no, had nightmares about that. I know. Scenario, I, but... Well, it was with Fonzie, which means automatically that it was awesome. Um, and he would just like, you know, he was one of the only, I don't know if other editors do this, but I've never seen another editor do this while he was working, like actually cutting, he would have on his laptop next to his desk, like playing from iTunes or, I mean, this was pre Spotify. So, he would just be playing his own music, like, like audibly. So, like, just hmm. cutting with the sound, the dialogue and stuff on very low. Is this like a? Is this in his brain a temp track? Is it a rhythm no, thing, or was no. it just like he just needed to just? Because we uh, worked with um, Marcus Shikawa, who was very famous. He taught me to. Uh, he used to put on baseball games on the <laughs> side. Oh yeah. And so I would put on basketball games sometimes when I was editing. Audio only, or with picture too. No, just actually only picture. You, I didn't want audio. Like, and it literally was, it was more just, you know, I always think of the problem with some editing is it turns into termite art so quickly because you get so involved in one cut that, that it's, it's, you just back off slightly. You realize does not matter and you should not be spending that much time on one cut because you're already making a mistake on that cut. And yeah. you know, so you're always looking, I, I try to take 15 minute breaks for perspective. So I'd always have the game on as just like, oh, there's another narrative in the room that like I can look up and then I'll look back at what I've been cutting and being like, oh, mm -hmm. this is crap from the conception. I need to like not be working on this match cut that does not, is in the wrong spot, you know? That sounds smart. I don't know that I could handle that. I mean, I, I, I do things to distract myself all the time, but it's rarely productive for work. But I think with Fonzie, he, I don't really know. I think it was just like, it relaxed him or I'm not sure what his whole theory with it was, but it was fun. Like it was just kind of, it had, it had this whole other layer to the, to the vibe while we were working in there. But then Jonathan came in like the last week and a half. Cause I think it was, we were planning for a screening or something, or it was, there was some goalpost at the end of this and, um, and he would come in and then when he was in, yeah, I mean, he was just, I'd never met him before. I didn't know anything about him. I mean, I, haven't even seen all of his movies never heard of this movie we're about to talk about before and uh <laughs> yeah. so but he yeah i mean impressions just like completely lovely human like a real human person he would he wore this like funky patchwork kind of jacket he like had a real sense of a real flair in his like very colorful um uh multi-layered look like very casual but like kind of you know jazzy mm. <laughs> and he was just like very relaxed and like good humored but like focused and and really like always working like constantly okay. like he had his notes and he had people coming and taking calls but then it was always like when it was lunchtime it was like you know like he would he would he there was some bodega nearby where we were cutting that had like some you know like he would always go there because they had this like vegetarian buffet that he really liked all of their different vegetables and stuff but then occasionally mm -hmm. we would order from carnegie deli or something and it was like fun but yeah uh, you're fitting what I wanted to hear, which is that he was a relaxed human being, lovely human being who like totally lovely human being who like was still was like a like diligent worker because I mean absolutely, and that was something that I really held on to to be honest because often you know you see people that are just like really cool and chill and relaxed or really intense about their work, but it's you know I don't I certainly have never been able to be both of those things at the same time. Um, <laughs> and I admire it because I actually think in the end, it's just such a, well, first of all, it's just such a much more pleasant environment. But I think the work, there's room for creativity with that kind of approach that, um, you know, he was always kind of like interested in following, oh, what about this? What about that? You know? Okay. Um, well, so I, th yeah. I think just as a fan, I just want to know someone who made personal films, like actually their personality match their films. So 
the bullet points uh, impression what for you on the dr work print or both of these or the theatrical and what were your well first of all I mean because you know the setup was sort of to compare these two things right so I feel right. like I can do the comparison obviously until I had seen both so I watched the work print yesterday and the release version today and also just to see if you like the if one of these versions actually worked for you which i mean it's clearly i'm not to like put my thumb on the scale one of them is clearly going to work and one is like Neh. right well i mean i expected obviously that i would prefer the director's work print version of the film over the studio cut just with the you know already knowing that there was this drama but I didn't necessarily expect that I would really like it. And I really did. Like, I thought it was just like the, 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 are we calling it the work print or the director's cut? I don't know if it's officially a director's cut because I'm part in, of the I've viewing. Been, I've been going back and forth on that because I think there was like two uh, director's cuts that they, they tested. There was, a, or there was the one he gave over the studio. And then there was another one. Like, I want to say he said he, he was okay with, they did like, 30 minutes of reshoots and he was okay with like two minutes of those and like they might have integrated those. I cannot things. imagine what this process was like for him. I mean, it must have just been so terrible. And this was r relatively early on in his career. He he'd had, I, I see, I was thinking about that. Like he's early enough to where he could get pushed around, but he had just done Melvin and Howard, which um, this is his follow-up to Melvin and Howard. And um, I mean, I don't think... I, I don't think he got pushed around until he probably lost autonomy with like um, the period after he made Beloved and uh, Truth About Charlie and and like he got like he made Manchurian Candidate which I don't think was he was a problem with the studios but um, he never made he's he after his Oscar winning s streak like he wasn't able to make the big movies he was making after like Philadelphia uh, going into Beloved and. Hmm. At a certain point, but even then, I don't because he ended his career as a TV director. Okay, or, or at least if you look at his IMDb, the majority of credits towards the end were, and it was weird because he started out doing the, um, like he did the Mike White pilot for Enlightened that mo that show with mm -hmm. Laura Dern on HBO, mm -hmm. which is solid, but then like he was doing like HBO sh or um, ABC shows in his last few credits. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I, I can all I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, in terms of the difference between the two of them and also, you know, just you can look at it just creatively, structurally, storytelling wise, you know, stylistically. But then, you know, to try to layer onto that, whatever the motivation would be to make those changes, because it's like, you know, that, it's not like that's the, kind of what I was thinking, too. Well, because it's not I mean, come on, it's like. It's not like this work print version is some sort of esoteric art piece. I mean, it is a fully commercial, very, you know, structured film. It has, it's, it's, there's nothing abstract about it at it's all. It's an organic script that works. And like, I mean, and it's also weird just because we, I know I've seen a ton of movies that, you know, behind the scenes, they had to rework it. And, I don't know if it's one of those things that as, as I w started getting further and as the career as an editor, I started seeing the seams more, but it's not even that I think in the work on the, on the theatrical cut, I see the seams so blatantly. It's just that the movie is tedious and the well, arc of the, of the main character is just bizarre. There's and no arc. Th it jumps around all over the place. And it's, you know, and, it, and it's also, okay, so having watched the work print first, obviously there's no way you can get that out of your head. So you're going to always be comparing the second thing. Oh, you to see the, first the scenes thing. after the work print. You definitely, and, and the thing that I think you and I would have in common, I think, I would I bug me watching the theatrical cut because I saw this movie for the first time probably around 2005, the theatrical cut, heard the legends about this director's cut because it first came on a um, sight and sound article f uh, written by Steen Vin Weinberg in like 1990 and um, but it wasn't available and then just suddenly it became available on torrents like I don't know two few years ago and then I finally found I've been googling this movie every few months like for 15 years and finally found it earlier this year and 
the thing I found, especially if you watch the director's cut and then you watch the theatrical cut, it's not that the scenes show, but you s it's the thing I always find when I have to watch Friends movies and they're in the middle of a process with a producer who's got some bugaboo, like some weird thing that they're like, this will fix the movie we need to fix, and no one else has a problem with it. Yeah. And like, and so you, 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 when you see the scenes, you see all these things that they're trying to fix, which are basically, we want to make, it's all about the problem is adultery, and we want to make the morality of this character, which seems like it's very, in the director's cut, very eloquently and artistically, and adultly played, we want to make this very middle brow to a very 80s audience. Yeah, I mean, it's 100% uh, morally flattened, but it's also, I mean, the word that I kept thinking with the work print version as I was watching it, what was giving me so much, um, you know, enjoyment out of watching it was that it was, it, I kept thinking, this is such an adult movie. Like it's, it's such an adult movie. It's, it's so, so adult. but not but in the best way. Like there's all these complexities. There's you know there's tangents. There's it's there's nothing plotted. It's light on its feet. The it you is, know that the this is one of Demi's known for that, and is really this is one of his best. The, the, that it never saw the light of day. There's so much humor. It's so relaxed. The performances are. It's like that wonderful feeling of you're in a period piece, and there's so much that they so much attention to detail not in just the way it looks but this the stylized way that they talk but yet it's still you know like it's so alive and it was so fun to watch but there were all these complexities and i thought i thought as i've thought before with his films um you know these female characters are so well drawn and so um multi-dimensional and the way that they move and the, the you know and that's a combination of performance and writing and sh all of the stuff that you have to do as a director right because we're talking about the direction as opposed to speaking specifically about the editing yeah and and so much of a direction is the details you choose to pay attention to so like if you pay attention to the idea of like we need to have three-dimensional women especially in the lead role in a movie about women. Yeah, but I just, and it just didn't feel, you know, and considering this is from 1984, like it didn't, f there was nothing about it that felt heavy handed. Sometimes, you know, you see movies that, that w you can tell that was a mandate. Make, make us a woman who, you know, the feminists will be happy with. But like this feels just, you're really, you're, you're telling this woman's story, Kay's story. And, you know, it's through her relationships with her friend and neighbor Hazel, with her husband, with her lover, with her work, with, you know, in the whole context of, you know, that time. And and so and then there are technical things, too. Right. Like there's I mean, just even the way that the time passes and you move from 1941 oh, to 1944. But I was struck by that in the original in the work print. I was like wow this is so graceful and you well, know there, there's two key scenes that are dropped out there's the um fdr annou announcement of fdr's death which actually is later but then there's the the subplot with holly hunter where like um, yeah a after her husband dies she ends up becoming a life mag she gets a, a, a life magazine and marries the uh the soldier that she has to put bring up on stage but there's a big announcement there i think and like it's so, and some of it is just very gracefully done. You want to give Demi credit, but at a very basic level, it is this is the plan you had in pre-production, going from the script that you that you enabled your director to do, and then you you try to fix it the last hour, and you keep losing this shit. Like, yeah, well, don't get me started on the whole. Oh, we hired this director or any crew member for that matter to do their job because we think this person is talented or we think this person knows what they're doing or we think this person is right for the job. That's why we're hiring you. And then at a certain point, it, you know, suddenly in we fact, see the <laughs> well, or, <gasps> no. or, or, I mean, or you just decide that in fact, you're not, they're not really interested in what this director has to say or how this, you know, person works. Because if you were, then, you know, you might not like it, but, I mean, I realize this is not <laughs> not a commercially viable opinion, but I just think it's such bullshit when people say, oh, we really stand behind this director, we really support this person's vision, and then they put up all these roadblocks and make all this, you know, 
jigsaw puzzle out of their out of their work without ever really trying to figure out what it was supposed to be in the first place. Okay, let's maybe uh, go into uh, let's start off with a little bit of the history of why, as far as we know, because there's not a lot of light around why this movie got recut. There was rumors at the time because Christine Lottie got a, an Oscar nomination for the theatrical cut, and the rumor was was that um, Goldie Hawn who had a say in like the final cut, even though she didn't have a producer's credit. Um, the rumor at the time, which doesn't seem to fit when you watch the director's cut, was that she was jealous of Lottie's performance. And the problem with that is, is in the director's cut, she probably could have gotten an Oscar nomination too. It's oh, an amazing sure. performance. She's incredible in it. And supposedly it was that she was coming off something like Private Benjamin. I think there was something else in between there. And, you know, she has a very fluffy 80s, as it were, with a lot doing a lot of Kurt Russell movies, which I want to ask you if you have any personal history with Goldie Hawn or Kurt Russell 80s movies. Oh, I wish. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, because some people, you know, like uh, um, one of Megan Ellison's favorite movies of all time is Overboard, the Goldie Hawn Overboard. I did not know that detail. I think it's a Look, I think it's a comfort movie, but I didn't even know that they were real life a thing until I read that somewhere in re- in relation to this before movie. this wow yeah, yeah. I, know. That's I mean the big that's the size of the rock that I'm you, under you I guess I think you're living a much more dedicated life the bullshit <laughs> that does not matter thanks Shane. <laughs> She, it's just the, the concern she had, like, of it, was, it comes down to uh, monogamy and adultery, uh, and it comes to her after she sees a you know, final can c- I, a cut. Can I, can I interject there? Sorry to cut you off. I don't think it no, does come down, it doesn't come down to that at all. I mean, in some, in some, you know, because the theatrical cut still has it. Well, but I I think right. I mean, and, and those might and so for okay, a couple things. First of all, I, it's I love that it's like of course the narrative is let's let's let, the gossip is it's a cat fight, you know. Goldie Hawn is jealous, you know, star jealous oh, of other. Oh, the the gossip at the time was complete bullshit. It, right. So I'm just saying, like that that's a very convenient way to set up this thing. I can pretty much it's a very guarantee Hollywood it, LA way of I can pretty much guarantee that there was definitely not a you know a high profile though she may be blonde actress making these calls I mean I I think there was for sure a studio exec if not several of them oh you you don't think it's Goldie Hawn doing this I mean I don't know this is not based in any sort of reality I have no idea I'm just saying if I, I because of all the things that we're talking about, her performance and the character's arc is completely jumbled in the theatrical release. The film, the, the, the changes that they made, so you were saying it comes down to adultery and there is this kind of like smoothing over of the complexities, but is it or because smoothing it's- Smoothing over is just the motives of why she wanted to do it and like enjoying that she did it too. Things like that. But it's not, it's not just about like adultery is what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to say. It's about these, the whole context of these women going to work in the factories and how, all, you know, the, the, this is Rosie the Riveter. This is like the birth of like all this feminist, modernist mm-hmm. stuff. And so women going to work, getting a sense of empowerment, making money. And they made a point of saying more money than the men that were yeah. off fighting yeah. the war. And, you know, and then having and then being expected to give all that up when their men come home so they can go back to being good little housewives. I mean... That to me is as much a part of what is at play as the adultery. It's about her freedom. I, I know I get that. I just think of the stuff that they changed in the theatrical cut, specifically. Um, the, the, bit, the first, the first big change. I do want to go through the movie a little closer, bit by bit. But like, um, the change started whenever Ed Harris, her husband, says they want to go to, or he's like, "I'm going to sign up," and. Then he's like, um, she, it starts almost right away where she's just like hugs and he goes, oh, I know. And 
and and then I don't know when the war letters start to come in and like the war letters read like the most cliched idea of a war letter. Like it's literally, it's like almost out of like forties propaganda of what a woman would write to in in the theatrical cut. I don't think and there were I don't remember there being any voiceover to the letter she sent to him. There's there's few later in the movie, but I and okay. Beyond that, then jumping ahead into when the affair happened, the biggest change in the movie, the biggest change in the movie happens Mm -hmm. where they move up the first date between the Kurt Russell's character, Lucky, and Kay Goldie Hawn's character. And he asks her out. There's literally in the theatrical cut or the, um, excuse me, the director's cut. He says, she says a line like, you've been asking me out for three months. And then in the theatrical cut, it's overdubbed and say (laughs) five months so that she's like, she gave out even much longer. (laughs) And there is some vaguely clever restructuring where like, basically she goes out with him that night to, um, uh, what was it? Was it the Egyptian room dance? And, um, she's going with friends. She, uh, she gets turned down to dance and she follows him and she basically has sex with him that night in like a very interesting scene and they end up repurposing some of that sex scene later. It's just, it's just, it's that the, the way that they, the seduction happens. I mean, it's such a sexy scene and it's so, um, and, and romantic and all the things that you need in order to sustain for the rest of the movie, you have to really believe you know, that yeah. that they're having this connection and this affair, that it's not, because otherwise it just feels tawdry and there's no real point to it. And I mean, it's not like, but but that it rides this balance, right? And the- Because the, the scene after that, that's the, the thing that the big change that worked is like, after that, she doubts it again. She's like, I don't want to go out with him again. And the next time, night, night they go out, there's a lot more doubt in her doing it. And, and, and her, and, right, that her, 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 after they have slept together and then they go out again and then she has this like crisis of faith was like what am i what have i done i i'm married i can't do this it's it's got so much you know there's guilt in there and there's fear and there's all these things that in the theatrical release by moving that scene up before they actually sleep together she, it just becomes this whole like prudish kind of like prolonging prolonging yeah. the inevitable you know it and, and it's yeah. it's pretty pointless um, and well, and then, and then when they finally do sleep together in the theatrical cut, there's this really tedious fight afterwards where she's like, "You made me do this," and oh, it's so bizarre. Because the thing is, like, what comes across so much in the director's cut is that she's a woman capable of loving both these men, and in the theatrical, it's more of a either or for big chunks of it. Yeah, it's 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 classic dumbing it down, you know, cutting it up, making it, you know, I mean, the and then yeah, so the reshoots, which I assume are reshoots, I guess it's possible that there are some scenes oh, yeah. that they just didn't include in the work print that they then, you know, use in the but they, they must have been reshoots because they incorporated dialogue from other scenes that they cut out, so they did it specifically. Sure. Uh, well, it's going to And you can just tell it, because like the makeup and hair is just different and the lighting is different and it's obvious you you, you did notice that i I don't have as good an eye for stuff like that but what is your experience have you seen work prints before because there's things like the uh, grease pencil and like Mm -hmm. i always would when i see work print i'm like is this supposed to be a dissolve or what's supposed to be happening here yeah no i've never seen any like what but i mean it was such a because it was the full complete movie i mean it had score and it had you know sound well there was clear opticals too there was clear yeah. mm-hmm. opticals because the wipes are the one of the big like tiny things i missed like this movie literally is the only time in film history i know of that has an unironic star wipe and it actually worked <laughs> yeah i mean and you know and it, it was it was just um but it was hard i mean so it's super low res obviously and yeah it, you that know, was, all, that was it was it's hard to see it was very muddied yeah. But given, I mean, that's that only adds to how compelling the film was because even though it's hard to see and that you know it's not really fully mixed and there's all these things about it that are make it cha- even more challenging to just sit back and watch it. I still, you know, at 14 minutes in, I, I check. Sometimes I like to. Look, I'm like, okay, when I feel like, oh, I'm really into this movie. I'm like, what time is it? Because you know, you always, I kind of am curious. Is it? Take... There was a time code at the bottom of this. There was a time code, though. so I was like, damn, 14 minutes in, and I was like, 
yes, take me on this ride. I want to know what is going on in this movie. And, Each, you know. So ba- basically, whenever every podcast episode, without fail, every movie, I fill one to two pages of notes. I really had trouble filling notes on the work print because I was just like, still into it. Like, this movie just works. Like, I could just write big. This movie's working. Well, and yeah. So, I mean, some of the things that I took away from it, which I... I guess in a way I was assuming let's see if these are the if any of this remains in the theatrical release version because you know it's there's some predictable stuff like you know anything that's vaguely um you know <laughs> obscure or maybe it requires a little bit more work on the part of the audience to figure out um that kind of stuff often ends up on the chopping block when you are going through a studio revision and sure enough, there's plenty of unnecessary exposition, ADR, and all kinds of things, reshoots that get added. But, but you know, I, I would say just to be fair, I mean, a lot of the humor and the, and the sort of relaxed pace of the performances survives other than in the reshoots. But, you know, this, this, this nuance of like, like that scene, you know, when they when when it all comes to a head, when Jack comes back, and you know, mm-hmm. then Hazel and and Lucky have their tryst, and then that whole thing, that scene between the two women having tea, you know, in that moment, it was very um, it was very emotional, and I found it, you know, I was like this, in you know, when she's like, let's be friends, there was nothing sentimental about it. It felt brave to me. It felt. Um, there's room for like all of these variations of experience. They're at war. They're living. I mean, they're living in a time of crisis, and it just felt bigger to me. And it felt like this is so interesting. This stuff can happen, and no one's getting punished. It's not like some she's gonna throw yeah, well, herself that... on the tracks of the train, or he's gonna die in war, and they're gonna have all this guilt. Like that's not what's happening here. That's so interesting. That this. That's one of the big things I think bugged the crap out of me when I just saw the theatrical version. Only thought the theatrical version was all I was gonna see because Jonathan Demi is known as a very humanist director who he he's he's a filmmaker's filmmaker and a lot of great like you know he's paul thomas for long as he's paul thomas anderson said he was his favorite director and like and paul thomas anderson followed him for a long time until he stopped doing it where this idea was that all your characters a filmmaker loves every single one of their characters and does not judge any of them and doesn't make any of them unnecessary antagonists who have to be like uh you know the voice uh, the uh the, pr- the perspective of the audience has to look down on them at any given point, especially when they're doing shitty things or things that the story seems to say point out is like, this isn't going to work out for everyone involved. Mm. And just, yeah. it's, and like in the theatrical that's gone. Like, that's just like, it's, it, you know, for like, there's always a sense of forgiveness in the characters when they do something wrong in Jonathan, good Jonathan Demi movies. Yeah. And like, it's not, in the theatrical or it's barely in the theatrical although what is also frustrating because you mentioned the tea scene that was there's quite a few scenes in the in in the theatrical that are pretty untouched but it goes to that that editorial mark some that yeah. if you've got a problem with the scene it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be the scene itself it's the scene 20 minutes earlier totally. it's the scene and you set it up with totally and that's the thing that can be like so that people don't always understand, like even you know, never. <laughs> never. And when you you can take it, you can take like okay, this is like version fifteen point six of our cut, and then somehow it's like, um, you know, if it gets handed to another editor or something happens where you you know you or you just are following somebody's paper notes or some something that happens that you know doesn't necess- it's not necessarily in the same organic evolutionary process that the yeah. that the director and editor are going through together uh you know you can look at that numerically like you're saying and you can say well you know yeah 75 percent of this cut is exactly the same as the version in, before it but that 25 percent that has changed affects the entire thing we know that you can just take you can just take the begin you can take the first 10 minutes out of a film and maybe you quote unquote don't need them but like <laughs> it's don't expect no. to just have the same experience at the end of the film because you well, it's didn't always, it's a sorry go ahead no that's that's it 
No, I always had this problem. It, the thing, the PTSD I got watching the uh, theatrical cut was you've, it's the time you've g dealt with like people from outside the editing room coming into the editing room and ask, you know, you've been working on this for six months. Have you tried this thing you tried <laughs> one month in? And uh, it's like in the abstract, I think it's going to work. And the problem with so much of this, uh, the long process of editing is I always describe it as a long division where you're not showing your work, where you mm. just get the answer. Someone looks at the answer and it's like, I, 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 my long, my, the work I did is gone. I can't show you why we didn't go down that route. And, and to be fair, there's definitely some like uh, uh, Gordian knots that can be cut by someone coming in with fresh eyes. And I'm not gonna, I'm not discounting that. And, but m a lot of the time it's just like, especially like the most thoughtless people when they come in the edited room who barely given more than like five seconds thought of this, like, why don't you try making that character smile to make them likable? Which is what it feels like so much of Goldie Hawn in the theatrical cut was, you know? Yeah, well, that, I mean, I have gotten that. And it's especially true of female characters. Surprise, surprise. I mean, I have literally gotten that note from so many middle-aged... Shocked, medi positively shocked. Middle-aged, mediocre, white, male execs. And also, to be fair, other you know, other editors who fit that same demographic. And oh, speaking of which, Julie, I forgot to tell you, we're recording <laughs> video on this. Just a <laughs> um, I just don't feel that she's likable enough. I just, if, if you could just make her a little more approachable, then I think our audience could really relate to her. Like, fuck you. You can't relate yeah. to a woman who's not smiling. Don't get me started. I can't. Well, and I also, I have a rant. I think I'm going to do a full podcast about the concept of movie likability, so I, I can't go down that road either. <laughs> but um, oh, I, th I don't know. I think the but whole I idea of going over the movie point by point and change by change is kind of the Oh, way I'm so know. sorry. I know. It's no, no, like... it's, no. It's just I, I'd rather. I mean, I did like... take notes. I did take notes. But it's it's hard because the notes, because it's a comparison piece. So you're constantly like having to go back and forth. I mean, we could go point by point, but I think I, that it's I did the it more overall... in the theatrical cut when the theatrical cut started getting pretty tedious. I started being like, okay. I well, it's emotionally it. confusing. You yeah. know, even even having having watched the movie the night before, I know what's going to happen, and I know... Th and those beats were so finessed. And, I mean, they were happening, and like, oh, this is where she... F this is... You could tell, but it, it never felt forced... And it, it felt, yeah, it felt like you're you're climbing this ladder. I don't know what the right visual is. But in the theatrical release, because so many of those moments were missing or they were jumbled or they were or they were unearned, then suddenly I'm sitting there not at all sure what I'm supposed to even be focusing on. And it just, yeah. it was very all yeah. over the place. And that is a total failure as far as I'm concerned. Well, let me ask you this, because I think you have more experience with having to... Um, I've never worked with a studio or vaguely. Uh, I always had to work with producer or production companies. So I have less, way less experience with dealing with director's cut when directors don't have final cut. Like generally the producers are always working or have a good relationship. I've had mostly good luck on that turn, knock on wood. This cut, what do you think? Was this just like the six weeks? Uh, I don't know what the director's guild uh uh, limit would have been at this time, but is this their six week cut? Do you think this is like they went through the full post process, turned it over, and I we're about to go no to a mix? Idea, but I mean, in terms of where he left off with his version, I mean, it's a it's a pretty solid cut, right? I mean, like you know, I don't think it was mixed, and I don't, and I mean, clearly it was. No, um, although there's there the, was, there's the opticals on it, but like and there I was think there music. Were, I mean, yeah. I, I they sw they switched composers between the, uh, the this one this one and the because the the score on the theatrical is pretty. Ugh. I would I would guess I have this is obviously not based again once again i'm gonna say something that is not based on any sort of reality or actual knowledge but, but your um, expertise well i mean or ex just my experience i guess like i mean i think when you get to the point where even though he wasn't you know as 
prolific and respected as he was later to become, he was still, you know, this is a major Hollywood movie. It's a big budget period piece with movie stars. You know, there you don't just like knock your director off after six weeks. You know, there's got to be at least some sort of process. So I would guess that they had already gone through some notes. They'd already done some stuff he didn't really like. He probably fought back on some things. I don't even know one one miss one. This is kind of you know technical, but one and the studio work I've done just to be clear is like studio light really. Like I haven't been up in like the big. <laughs> you know, uh, dark belly of the beast. Sure. I've had I've had some experience. Not to name <laughs> not to name names, but I think that there was. Um, I think that there is this other component that is really problematic now, and I don't know what this system was like in 1984. But the whole system of doing these audience test screenings, these previews, I think is the worst possible system and it's one of those things that everybody kind of acknowledges it i mean every every film i've ever worked on that has had to do one of these test screenings everyone is like oh god we have to do it i know but the studio and everyone kind of talks about how it's such a bad idea but no i mean there's apparently there's no fighting it um because it's the only metric that these people know how to use because at a certain level yeah they are not creative people. They are marketing people. I mean, not to say marketing people aren't creative. That's well, no, no, not no. Because I, I, I always compared <laughs> it to the Bible, where it's like it's this political tool to where people can use it for whatever they needed to use it for. It's like the devil yeah, can find scripture. Yeah, right, you know? right, sure. There is that, but I mean, the idea that you're going to take, you know, find some number and base, you know, your decisions off of that. I mean, I realize that as I'm saying this, that is what our current entertainment landscape is. We are working off of an algorithm them but like you know that it's 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 so ludicrous and it's like antithetical to me i could get so angry about it but you're right i think there's i mean it's data and i think it can be useful but i've yeah i've seen well, it I mean, used and manipulated in ways the artistry is always the believe. note behind the note right like the artistry is knowing like it's not it's to get the people in the room and then feel the room it's not what they write. It's not what they tell you to change. It's or even what they felt. It's just like, did, did they did they exhale at the right spot? Did they laugh at the right spot? Did they get tense at the right spot? Because you feel the air in the room in those screenings. Yeah, Don't, that's the notes that's. Really and then helpful. they have these focus groups where and they you know pick a few people at the end, and it's like this one person had this one bee in her bonnet about something, mm-hmm. and then it becomes like the next four weeks of editing are about, well, but, you know, remember that person in the focus group who was very confused about such and such? And Did you're I like, ever Ugh. tell you when I was, when I was in LA, I was uh, on a, um, I, uh, I went into a test screening and ended up in a focus group on a Farley Brothers movie, Hall Pass. Oh yeah, no, I didn't, I don't think we've discussed this. I, I okay. I, I when I was in LA, I wrote down, like I got on a list to be on some of these test screenings and I remember um, you had a line that you had nothing to do with movies. And I... I <laughs> you, had, this... you had to lie and say that you had nothing. Okay, right, go on. Yeah, no, you, cause you, you, <laughs> you, you couldn't have anything you to do with movies. You had to lie. Okay, go on. <laughs> yeah, I had to lie. Um, the, the, uh, uh, no, because I saw... Um, oh, what's the Amy Schumer? Uh, Trainwreck. I saw mm-hmm. Trainwreck that way, too. But um, on Hall Pass, I remember I got in the focus group and made a point. It's like... I'm on the side of the filmmakers. I'm <laughs> going to keep quiet and just say everything was good. <laughs> yeah, you're corrupting the data set. <laughs> this this data set that's not being used. And I saw, I don't know if I ever saw the final cut or not, but I'm, does anyone remember Hall Pask? No. So. Yeah. Anyway, that was, a, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, in terms of like what, I mean, I think from, again, the light Googling I did around the subject, because I didn't want to do too much research before we talked, but I wanted to have at least some background. It did. It does seem like he actually, like, officially distanced himself from the film, right? Like, denounced oh. the film, you know? So that's, well, that's, yeah, that's he, a bigger deal. He did the deal. thing where he, Demi had a thing, a specific credit. He always put a Jonathan Demi picture, which I don't know. I think Scorsese followed that, too. And he took that off this. But he, um, the screenwriter, uh, uh, 
Nancy Dowd was the original screenwriter. They had Bo Goldman and somebody else who was ended up doing more of the credit writing. But on the theatrical cut, Nancy Dowd took her name off that, and the credit is Rob Morton. Um, and <laughs> Robert Town ended up doing supposedly a lot of the uh, rewrites because everyone went to Robert Town, the script doctor stuff in the 80s, and no one, very few people seem to be happy about it. Um, one of the, the, the UPM and like one of the credited producers on this movie is a guy named Charles Mulvihill who like worked with, um, town and Nicholson in the, in the seventies. And he is the namesake for, um, one of the characters in Chinatown. And I, yeah, oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. So like, uh, well, cause Speaking he went to the town. Ta- oh, go on. Go ahead. I was no, going to say, you, this is like movie trivia, but there are some sick cameos in this movie too. Well, Corman is always in uh, um, a bunch of uh, Jonathan Demme movies. Yeah, and the he's I guess he's the head of the factory, which is a very it, yeah. He's a real McBride. Factory. Yeah, he yeah. Okay, I didn't do anything about it. Um, but I thought that was that was fun and Belinda, Belinda Carlisle. Carlisle? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes. Well, of course, but Demi is so was so you know such a knowledgeable okay. music you, per- person, and he was always good about and loves well, music. Okay. He was always good about putting random music people in. Um, Rick Springfield's in his last feature, uh, Ricky and the Flash. Um, mm. But guess who was originally, uh, Demi was looking into playing the um, lucky part that Cut Russell played. Who? Bruce Springsteen. Shut up. Oh, That was who he was looking into gee, originally. That would yeah. have been amazing. Although Kurt Russell was perfect in this. Kurt he was Ru- Kurt- so cute. Oh, my God. Kurt Russell is like every movie's MVP that he's in. So he it's kind was, of, yeah, it was, it was because originally, because so originally the Christine Lottie part uh, was supposed to be a Hazel. It was supposed to be um, Mary Steenburg and from mm. the follow up from Melvin and Howard, but then she got pregnant. Supposedly mm. that's what I read I'm about not, going into. It. I don't know anything about that actress. I mean, again, probably just another Christine Lottie side of the rock that I'm under, but yeah, I'm just like, who is this woman? No, She's incredible. She, she, I mean, this is her Oscar nomination. She, I knew her from TV more than anything. She else. was so fantastic. That was that reminds me that that was another crucial mistake that these bozos made in their theatrical release. The moment where you know, there's like that moment where um, after the whole um, debacle with Jack, and uh, he he asks, uh, he shows up at the factory, and he asks Hazel if she wants to come here and play, and she's like, I don't think so, honey. Like, you know, clearly he's been drinking, and she's like, mm-hmm. for, and she's not gonna, she's like, you know, be careful as he goes okay. off. Yeah. And, the, and then in the work print, there's a moment, and I don't really remember exactly what the blocking is or what the stage action is, but there's a definitely a moment where she could, where she's like on her way home, or she gets home and she's thinking about it, and she decides. We see her decide. You know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna see him play his horn, euphemistically speaking, of course. And yeah, then, yeah. and then, in the theatrical release, that's completely out. That's she, gone. It, it cuts and... straight away. She's and then she walks straight into the club, and then they're like kissing outside. It's like bam, bam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. There's was, none re- of I, the. I couldn't like, remember if it was fast up. in the theatrical or not. I know there's a beat in the scene after that, after the tea scene, where they have their um, K gets way too drunk in confrontation. First off, they miss the point where. Um, where Russell, um, Lucky goes on stage and does his solo horn thing where he's like, this is for everyone who's like been yeah. loved and been hurt by it. Yeah. But then there's a moment where Hazel looks at Lucky and there's a thing where it's like, I don't know if it's more serious or she, you know, what, or just this meant more to her. And that's what really sets Kay off to like, she's going to go off on her mm-hmm. that moment. Getting all this, like, adult complexity that's, like, we need to paper this through, or or paper this over. Yeah. In the theatrical cut. And then, so it's weird to think about, if we want to sort of somewhat resume the the more technical conversation about what was changed, like, when you can say it's, it's it's as much about what you take out as about what you leave in, right? Right. And so it's, like, because not only were there things that they removed... But then they did all these reshoots. So the things that, and usually, and again, in my experience with reshoots, it's almost always, it's almost always not really necessary from a certain point of view. But it's necessary 
if your it's necessary if your bottom line is there can be no doubt about what's happening here and it's always overly expositional and it's always yeah. kind of humdrum and heavy handed and that is yeah. for sure whatever these reshoots were that were just like let me let me reiterate exactly what's happening here blah 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 and it was weird because you get this other side of Jack and that was something that I did think about in the work print I was like you know he's hardly there right you see him in the beginning and then you see him when he comes back a little bit but this whole time and I think that's also I mean it's much easier to I mean presumably he's writing back to all the letters that she's written him he doesn't just disappear for three years but you don't see those letters and you don't get any sense. She just stops talking about him after a while. And then, yeah. you know, they've made him a much bigger presence when he comes back on leave and they have these kind of, you know, uh, these t- these sort of tepid domestic dramas. And, you know. Well, did, I, uh, did you have anybody in your family in World War II? I mean, yeah. Grandparents. Yeah, my, 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 yeah, my two grandparents. I, but I started thinking about the other day, both my grandparents married, at, I think they both married after World War II, so they never had to deal with this. But, like, th- I mean, a big part of the theatrical, the complexity, and I guess overall what their tr- the, the point of the movie originally was supposed to be about was, like, what are these people seriously supposed to do when they change over five years, especially if they're at the beginning of a marriage, the beginning of a yeah. serious relationship. And these people are gone for three years to to do work that, like everyone needs to do but just like because she grew like the movie ends up being about Kay's growth while he's gone and mm-hmm. so it makes sense that he should just be not he should be mythic in his absence and but his absence should be significant but that's also what I found again in yes I agree and in that scene where he comes back on the leave and they have that walk on the beach, which was removed from the theatrical release, where, you oh, know... Oh, and... Or the, the way they turn, how he finds out about the affair. Yeah, I mean, like that, that, none, none, oh, of that. none of that. None of that. I mean, that was just... Well, no, no, that that whole thing bug crap me, because that, like... Like, I found this Pauline Kale quote from uh, the original release uh, in her review. It was... Uh, a passive Goldie Hawn seems like a violation of nature, and the she's whole thing not, is like, yes, but that's the point. She's not passive in the. She's the one. She's like, I'm, yeah, she's, and, she and confronts I him. And the director's she loses in the theatrical cut. She loses so much agency. She loses so much. Like Jack had the or or Lucky uh, had sex with me. You're the one that drew me into this relationship. And then when Jack gets back from World War II, he's the one that like figures out that the affair was. And in the director's cut, it's such an amazing moment where he just she just stops and says i there's another guy well, like it's yeah. just so modern and, he, and he, forthright and also he doesn't have a clue or maybe he does but he doesn't want to think about it and he's all in his he's like yeah he's like i've got i think so he doesn't many, want to think about he's it like, i've got he plans doesn't. he's like i've got plans when this war is over when i come back i have plans and i will say that it's it's sort of you know he's not a he's not it's not like you're supposed to this guy i mean he's he's a limited character but like he has he's living in his own reality and i think that that idea of like how much the country really shifted in those war years and there were people that were there for it and there were people that were not that were and i think that's i mean this is modern it's like the modern era modernism this is like you know a very seminal moment in american history not just the Mm -hmm. military history but culturally obviously and this is a huge part of telling that story in such a in such a, you know, it's t- you're telling it in the story of these two people, but it is such a, you know, I mean, it's symbolic. the biggest moment we've, biggest moment as a country we faced until now. Until now, will. but you until know, now. well, but I found that moment, you know, a- after she tells him, and there's this like strain between them, and then you know something happens, and then he leaves in the taxi cab in the morning, and she comes running after him in his pajamas. You know, and she's and she's distraught, and 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 the only thing he says, he's like, "Did you get my note? No. What did it say?" And he just doesn't. He doesn't. And he's he's feeling. He doesn't. You know, he's so this typical. I can't man, believe you did this. Or yeah, what is it? He, he said? said, "I can't believe what you've done," and it's so heartbreaking because it's 
you know, I could I could imagine those words being said about any number of things in the context, not just his wife's infidelity, but you know, things that he probably saw at war, things that have been happening, all of this stuff. It's heartbreaking. And then in the theatrical release of, you know, it becomes not not only do we know that he's written a letter, then we have to hear the voiceover as she. The looks scene at the... is pretty close to the theatrical, but then the letter. That was what I was going to earlier about this letter writing voiceover. But it's also the there's platitudes. the whole. Yeah, that's that. But that's that there's was that. that was that note that was he late, left much later. But then also, but but the entire scene is defiled by the previous reshoot material in which they hash it all out in this very like flat typical cliched way about you know blaming each other and I'm sorry I made a mistake and whatever 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 so they've already had all this it's so much more to me it's so much more um, emotional and true people don't when you don't say all that stuff and it's just these few words that have to carry so much and he's leaving and he's going back to war and I don't know. I just found I found that. I don't really know if you. I, I I in the past I found that when I get a letter and if I can imagine the Hallmark card voiceover version of that, that it means so much more to me that way. I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, a few more things I, I wanted to get into. Um, are you familiar? I, are you familiar with the uh, Jonathan Demi close-up, uh, or is it frequently uh, put in the Demi CU? No, as a like as a filmmaking. There term? was one. There was one significant one. I, I think there's multiple ones, but Jonathan Demi's known for what he'll do is he'll do a shot reverse shot, and gradually, to emphasize one point in the scene, he'll suddenly do in the shot reverse shot suddenly switch to the close-ups will be the main character looking straight at the lens and they're center punched mm. and they're looking straight at the camera i did and notice that it's when jack comes home oh the, okay there's one i when know jack when jack and says, lucky I, shake hands that that well, yes, it wasn't okay, a, it okay, wasn't yeah. it wasn't a close-up though it was a medium shot but i did notice that all of a sudden they were looking at the camera in the in the director's cut, when he says I need to enlist, there's one in there. And I looked up the trailer that's in the trailer. In the theatrical cut, it's not there. But the Demi CU is one of my favorite basic devices. Like it's such a simple thing that Jonathan Demi got famous for. And like some of the filmmakers took it up on their own. But I remember one time I was working on a movie, and um, I, I went to a script reading of it early on, and. When it came to a point, it was it was a production script reading. It wasn't an actual actor script or anything like that. There, it was a really sparsely written script with a lot of white space in it, but there was a part in it with no camera directions. But then one camera direction came up and it said, Demi, see you. And it ended up being one of the best scenes in the movie. Mm -hmm. And I texted the director while I was reading. He was like, you were so badass for two putting that in. Because it's, it's such an effective tool, especially, but it has to be sparsely used. It has to be sparsely used. And Demi used it more as he went on later, but I don't know if you had any strong reaction to that. Um, the other thing, uh, I just had some other tangents, like the score, like I mentioned, I, I bitched about it earlier, but it was a Bruce Langhorn who did the uh, theatrical and Patrick Williams is a TV guy who did, um, he did his, he got an Oscar nomination for breaking away. He, my favorite score of his that I, when I saw him on his IMDb would have been used cars. But he also did a bunch of um, Richard Lester movies, which uh, past listeners of the podcast uh, might note for our Robin and Marion episode. Uh, I don't think he did Robin and Marion, but he did some Richard Lester ones. Um, the other thing I was thinking of, have you ever read uh, uh, William Goldman's book, Adventures in Screen Trade? Mm -mm. This whole theatrical, the director's versus theatrical cut reminded me of this story he tells early on in the book about how to write for movie stars. And he uses uh, Tender or um, Great Santini uh, and Duval, Robert Duval and Great Santini as an example, because there's a scene in there where um, Robert Duval is playing basketball with his son. And sh long story short, or long, long spoiler short, he loses to his son and he gets pissed off that he's losing to his son. He gets pissier to his family. And it's this like dramatic scene in the middle of it. 
And Goldman was talking about how amazing it was that that scene actually got through, shot, and released because most movie stars just will not let themselves look e either A, like they lose anything, or B, as unlikable. And then he gave these examples about how if he were a screenwriter in that movie with another movie star, how they would make him rewrite the scene. And it's always, they would have a scene beforehand where like they'd make it seem like the movie star is just like, would do the act still, but the scene before would be like, this is just an act. Where just like the wife would come up to Robert Duvall's father character and say like, uh, uh, you know, he's just not, our son's just not coming out of the shell. Can you, you think there's something you can do? And like, Goldman repeats this like gag over and over where he's just like, oh, the old inferiority, huh? Or, oh, the old repression, huh? <laughs> and like, then the scene would play out as it was scripted where like, the, like it's almost as if the actor, the movie star actor would then wink to the audience know that he's not really an asshole who's doing all these mm. asshole actions, but... That's what this this movie, the, the the theatrical cut had this desire to be liked that was so misguided and so yeah, yeah. middle brow and so because the, the there's like I think like four minutes difference between the two cuts and like one was just a tedious slog of of just that you could not follow the trail on. But and yeah, the other was, but I mean, in somebody's world, that equates as more marketable because i mean it wasn't it wasn't 1950s era era like you know morality police that was doing this i think it, at the, the bottom line is always what's going to sell more I mean, no matter you know what their message is the, there's there's I, no moral compass see, I at think work the, here I, I think the bottom line is always the lowest common denominator denominator and fear of a dumb audience and it's or but apparently this movie bombed, so the audience was smart enough not to like it. Yeah, got delayed. It was supposed to be a big Christmas 83 release. Got to um, Everyone vaguely knew that the, the cut stuff was happening. Um, we haven't even talked much about uh, Biscuit character, the, uh, oh, yeah. uh, or, or the Fred Ward character, where they cut the one of the other big cuts with him is the smack scene at the beginning with Christine Lottie and like he then mm. spends the rest of the movie asking to be forgiven and it just makes no sense throughout the whole thing and um there's this there um what else do we have the bizarre um Carly Simon song in the <laughs> intro the title sequence yeah and at the end isn't that her too the, this weird uh, freeze frame of the of the girls oh. hugging like well, she's a rama the one thing that was one of my favorite things when I first saw the, uh, the director's cut for the first time is uh, the very new last scene on the beach. It, that was the part where I was like, this is really touching. And there is this uh, cue on there by this guy, um, this synth, uh, Japanese synth artist named Guitaro, who did, um, he did a few scores, the most notable American scores. He did an uh, Oliver Stone movie, Heaven and Earth. But it's weird that you like, the director's cut has better period music, more period sensitive music, because um, all the the theatrical has this like re-recorded uh, pastiche thirty stuff that just sounds like it's came from the eighties, and then but the the director's cut is so close to it. And then suddenly this last piece has this beautiful silhouetted shot of Kay and Hazel, and they have this beautiful moment where they both have a beer and they entangle their arms like they're drinking at a wedding with like the sunset behind him and this really synthy metaphysical piece plays over the end credits. Mm -hmm. I know it's I just, noticed it, that. Oh, it was so touching to me. Like yeah. I cause I mean, I thought I knew what I was expecting with the story and that just, that was one of those. It modern, like it a, modernized it. I mean, then all of a sudden it definitely, you it, were like, Oh, well, I like which, to think it made it timeless. Uh, I that's, thought it, I, that's the next word I was going to cut. I was going to say it, it, it made it, Yes, timeless. Feel timeless yeah. in that in that like, in in that very split second. Also, because it's a long lens, they're silhouetted against the sun. I mean, it, they could it could have been any time. I mean, you assume it's in you know nineteen forty four. I try to recognize. Oh, were they wearing the same stuff? You from couldn't the, really. Uh... I mean, probably. Yeah, I think it was. It was in. It was definitely like you know the next day or something, the next weekend. But in the abstract created by this 
piece of music that you're describing and just the whole thing, it felt bigger than that. And it felt like this yeah. is a friendship that will go on yeah. into the future. It's, it made you feel this is what the movie was really about. Like yeah. it's about their friendship. And the thing is like, uh, Vinberg in his sight and sound piece pointed this out. Like the theatrical ends with this like vaguely, um, like lip servicey feminist idea of like uh, we can do it hug whenever she says we did it at the last line th yeah but th but this one when he says we did it it's more like this celebration of like we we survived this bullshit of all the other stuff in our lives and we had this friendship we did it it was it wasn't as and then the last shot that last shot and last Pete music piece just kind of added to that um I mean th the thing I keep finding about Jonathan Demi like you, you mentioned the details and, and we both talked about how effortless this stuff is, but like there's this feeling that like he doesn't sweat the small shit too at the same time. Like, mm -hmm. like, any, like he can let complexity go in and the theatrical worried about every moral decision and had to second guess it and then just ended up being scattershot and all over the place. And I think the real, look, it's nice that like, if you do some judicious Googling, you can find this movie now, the director's cut of this movie. You can find a muddied version of it ripped off from a VHS that has a uh, time code at the bottom and four by three cut off. You can find it. But uh, Demi, the last thing I heard him talk about, it, he's like, they asked him in the early aughts if he w would work on a director's cut. And he's like, these elements have been destroyed. I can't, I, mm. it's not, you, you, can't ma you can't make a better version of this. I think I did see someone post like, um, I imagine you you wouldn't have heard of the uh, Star Wars uh, despecialized version where like they took. Why the do you assume I wouldn't have heard of that, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do see that giant uh, Star Wars mural behind you, and you are wearing Princess Leia buns right now. Uh, but um, the, what they did was they took they the internet, the Reddit form or whatever, just keeps like the best version of uh, of the movie and with the current color timing or the best color timing, and then matches it up with the original cut. And just puts it onto there. I was going to say, I've seen, you see all kinds of crazy restoration stuff that people are doing. I mean, I'm sure that like somebody could could make a much more presentable mm. version of that if if they. I I think to. I saw one. I think on the other hand, the positive on this was the end of the um, Sight and Sound article compares this to Magnificent Ambersons, and at least this is available as a torrent on the internet, or you can find it if you Google somewhere. Whereas Magnificent Ambersons. That last cut, that that cut is buried somewhere in Brazil, somewhere in a mental asylum or something, and no one will ever <laughs> find it. Yeah. Well, um, Julia, uh, how'd you feel on your first episode on here? This was much less terrifying than I thought it was going to be. So you're gonna come back? I feel like <laughs> I, I feel neglected. Like you need to have your own like normal bio episode. Oh drawn up gosh. Sort of anyway, uh, Julia Block, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank mm -hmm. you.